It seemed more like a business trip than a vacation when Philip finally stepped onto the airport runway and looked around the dull terminal building. The heat was overwhelming, and the burning herbal smell reminded him of how much he loved the Mediterranean. He was tired, it was early in the morning, and the trip did not bring him as much pleasure as usual. When he got his luggage, he finally sat down with a cup of coffee and watched as passengers fussed with their luggage, rushing to get away quickly. Try as he might, he couldn't figure out what to do, so he just sat there. Gradually, he began to relax in the heat, and the headache that had arisen from the awkward start to the day began to subside. When the shuttle bus arrived, it was crowded, and there was no air conditioning. The driver seemed to trust his fate, and that of his passengers to the icons and relics that were hung around his windshield as he pulled the long bus over switchbacks and over the mountains to the sea. Several times, on turns, Philip was pressed against his neighbors, a silent young couple who, no doubt, had also been traveling since the middle of the night. Despite the inconvenience, they became friends. Tim and Nicole were on their postponed honeymoon. Happy to have found someone to talk to, Philip explained that he was seeing his wife Tibby for the first time in four months. He noticed the surprise on the newlyweds' faces at this confession, but was not going to reveal the details. He said that he worked at a bank in London, although in fact he was unemployed, he had quit his job the day before. The bus finally stopped, and Philip looked across the neat lawn at the entrance and the large sign with the image of a Greek god, Prometheus Resort Gardens. He came down and exclaimed in surprise, not bad, Nicole's reaction, addressed to him rather than her husband, was more emotional. This is just heaven. Snow White chalets climbed up the rugged hillside, each with a neat flower bed that was irrigated to counteract the arid climate. To the right was a winding strip of white sand and the sea just like the picture in the brochure. A uniformed employee raised the barrier and their bags were unloaded from the bus onto a patch of scorched lawn. Philip looked around for Tibby, but she was gone. Not knowing what to do, he was alarmed by the sound of a motorized buggy approaching along the gravel path. A tall man in a blue suit, too hot for the weather, jumped out of the buggy with a badge on his lapel bearing the resort logo and the advertising slogan, Vacation Fun Day and Night. He walked up to Philip and shook his hand. You must be Philip. Nice to meet you. Tibby will be glad you came. I'm your manager, Ben Mills. He brushed back his dark wavy hair and smiled smugly. If you need anything, contact me. I want you to have a good time. The manager, throwing luggage into the buggy trailer, quickly looked around the group and walked up to Nicole, shaking her hand, and the sleeve of his light gray suit rode up revealing a thin wrist with a skull tattoo. Turning to Tim, he also put on an empty smile and shook his hand. You'll love it here, the best beach in the Aegean Sea. Guests walked slowly along the path lined with white painted stones, enjoying the sun, while Tim and Nicole sat next to Ben in the buggy and drove to the resort office. Sweating in his traveling clothes, Philip was registered as a young man with close cropped hair and black stubble. He looked like he worked out at the gym for three hours every morning, and his t-shirt again with the resort's logo tightly hugged his torso. So you are Philip. You must be looking forward to getting into the holiday spirit, he said with an obsequious smile. What? Philip was roused from his sleepy stupor. You'll love it here. I'm here to make your holiday perfect. Feel free to contact me with any questions. It's strange, said Philip confused by the fact that everyone knew him through his wife and seemed to think that he urgently needed help to enjoy his holiday. The manager said almost the same thing. Don't pay attention to Ben. If you need anything, contact me, the young man said, putting on a creepy smile and wiping his sweaty hand on his stomach. Philip walked up the hill to his chalet, past neat flower beds and hanging baskets. The climb was steep, and when he got there, he saw that Tim and Nicole, his neighbors, had already settled into a chalet directly above his. Shameless, he shouted at Tim. You suck up to the manager just so you can ride in the buggy. Come to us when you're settled in and help us drink this champagne. The manager says he gives a bottle to one couple from each group of arrivals. Good for business, as he put it. Don't feel guilty. 
He'll make you pay for it. I'll come by in a while. Maybe my wife will show up too. More the better. Philip was preparing for the moment of the meeting and was disappointed that Tibby did not meet him. Opening his chalet, he saw a bag by the bed he was traveling light and looked around the room without pleasure. The refrigerator was stocked with wine and cheese. There was a multi-channel TV, shower, and air conditioning. He turned on the air conditioner, lay down on the bed, then stood up and opened the sliding window. It opened onto a balcony overlooking the beach and rocky coastline to the south. Outside, he waved to Tim, who was sitting on his balcony. Behind the chalet was a wild mountainside covered with thorns and an overgrown terrace of olive trees. At the first opportunity, he intended to climb the ridge. Below was a resort about fifty chalets and several larger buildings. Walls simulating a medieval castle lined one end of the resort. Bad taste and inappropriate, Philip thought. Closer, in front of the beach, there was a swimming pool surrounded by a cafe terrace and sun loungers. He watched as a woman in a hat and bikini walked from the cafe counter to one of the sun loungers and stretched out in the sun. After getting comfortable, she took off her bikini top. Returning to the room, he found a note at the door. Darling, I'm so happy that you came. Lots of work, but I hope to meet you for dinner. Enjoy, your loving wife. He thought about the note and suspected that Tibby had some kind of plan, but he had no idea what it was. She had secured the chalet for him, a gift for his hard work, she assured him. Don't worry, you won't have to compensate me for this. At first he was reluctant to accept the leave, suspecting a hidden meaning in the gift and wondering what his wife hoped to achieve. But the thought of meeting Tibby took its toll. Perhaps this was her compromise, an attempt to say sorry. Whatever her plan, they had to decide what to do with their comatose marriage. He was sure that it was all over, but he didn't know what he wanted. Four months of separation was a long time, but essentially he was still in shock. The break was too sudden, too unexpected for him to comprehend. Tibby's sudden departure left him unable to understand why she had fallen out of love. He received only rare letters in which she told how she was having a good time, but not a word about why she left. She said she wanted to do something with her life, and as far as he could tell, she had succeeded. He was lonely and admitted to himself that he missed Tibby, but mostly he was angry and upset about her leaving. Then an email arrived about a free chalet. It took him several days to agree to the proposal, knowing that he would most likely regret it. Quitting my job was a way to force myself to take control of my life. He was stuck in the bank because of the high salary. Rich, but hating every day of work and dissatisfied with his life, he saw no point in money that did not bring him any pleasure. He didn't know what he would do next. What went wrong? One lazy Sunday afternoon, as he was recovering from a terrible week, Tibby told him that she didn't love him anymore, that their marriage was a prison, that they were making each other miserable, and that she needed to move on on her own. This happened after ten years of marriage, during which both put maximum effort into their work. Tibby's statement shocked Philip, and for three days they walked around each other, almost without speaking. Everything Philip could have said was meaningless, because without love his words were useless. Why fight for a relationship when love has died on one side? He couldn't make Tibby love him. She insisted that she had no other man, and he believed her. She was not replaced by someone better. Everything was worse. In her eyes he was unloved, unwanted, even if he were the last man left on earth. Perhaps she never loved him, but only saw him as a convenient provider and protector. Now that she had gained self-confidence and financial independence, he became unnecessary. Tibby then announced that she was quitting her job as a teacher to work for a travel company. Moreover, in a few days she is leaving on a business trip to their flagship resort on the Mediterranean Sea. Philip didn't have time to realize this. Tibby loved being a teacher. She adored children, and there was no such thing as too much work for her. It seemed obvious that she was making a mistake, but he knew that she would ignore anything he said. The day of departure arrived, and, no doubt, both were full of desire to say something important, corresponding to such a significant event. None of them said a word. When it was time to leave, 
Tibby assumed a casual air and managed to say something both false and ridiculous. Take care of yourself, Philip. I'll be in touch, and don't worry about anything. I know everything will be for the better. And that was all over, except for rare letters and messages. None of them were about their future together. Philip immersed himself in work and developed a phobia of his home. It was difficult for him to be in familiar rooms without Tibby's presence. He spent most of his free time in pubs, at football matches, or hiking in the countryside. Wherever he went, he could not escape the recurring nightmare of those last days, their words and understatements. And the killer question, was their marriage a lie from the very beginning, or did they ever really love each other? The friends he talked to all said the same thing, forget Tibby and move on. You're out of luck, but you'll get through it. But now he hated humanity and hated himself. Move on, what's the point? He asked himself this question, but never found an answer. Lying on the bed in the chalet, he closed his eyes and almost fell asleep. But then he heard Tim calling him, offering to come in while the champagne was still cold. He changed his clothes, put on a sun hat and sandals, and went to a nearby chalet. Nicole answered the door wearing a red printed sundress that left her shoulders bare. Tim was fiddling with a champagne cork on the balcony. There was silence until the cork flew out with a loud bang. He filled the glasses and raised one. Here's to a happy holiday. Let's enjoy the sun. And long live Ben, the resort manager, Philip added, thinking that the first toast should have been to a happy marriage for the newlyweds. I like drinking his champagne. What a bastard, Nicole snorted. This kind of thing shouldn't appear among women. Easy, Nico, Tim said after a pause. He just tried to make us feel at home. He looked at all the women on the bus and chose me, Nicole replied. Don't ask why, but he did everything to flatter me. It's a compliment, Philip said. He thinks you're beautiful. He thinks I'm a woman of easy virtue. Philip was stunned and did not know what to answer. Hardly. I'm sure you're making this up, Tim said. He could have chosen anyone. Just enjoy the champagne. Anyway, I raise a toast to the happy couple. I'm not sure what words are appropriate for a postponed honeymoon, but let's toast to an unforgettable vacation. May you always be accompanied by happiness and wonderful moments ahead. He raised his glass, but the couple looked at the floor in embarrassment. Confused by this reaction, Philip took a nervous sip and began talking to Nicole about flying, resorts, places to eat, and such things. Soon they were talking animatedly about their favorite places in London and Paris. Why did you come? She finally asked. There's nothing here. This resort looks like a sad retirement community. There's sun and beach here, and it's nice to do nothing, Philip answered cautiously, not sure how much he wanted to reveal himself. I would like to climb the mountains, but other than that I'm just going to relax. I'll drink beer, read a book, swim, and lie on the beach. I'll go to the mountains with you, Tim said. We shouldn't have come here, Nicole said suddenly. This is a mistake. It's not fair to Tim. Philip was taken aback by her abruptness. He turned to Tim. Tim, you like it here, don't you? Tim nodded, his expression unreadable. I shouldn't have come, Nicole continued. I have to practice. Practice of what? asked Philip. I'm a pianist. I have a concert in a month. But even a pianist has the right to rest, like everyone else, he said. She shook her head impatiently and fell silent. We're here so Nicole can distress, Tim added with forced calm. When we get back, you'll feel much better and it will show in your game. She shrugged irritably and fell silent again. It seemed to Philip that he and Tibby weren't the only couple who couldn't communicate. Well, the champagne is good, he said, trying to fill the silence. Despite the dubious origin, we should do our best to enjoy our holiday, so let's finish the bottle. It was an uncomfortable conversation, but still a distraction from his own problems. Philip said goodbye to the newlyweds and walked down to the beach, past an absurd statue of a busty girl with a jug. The sea beckoned, and he decided that he should take a swim. The feeling of seawater should have lifted his spirits. 
Instead, he sat at a table on the sand under a canopy of palm leaves. There was no one on the beach, and only after a while did he notice that there were no children here the resort was apparently only for adults. It's a shame because he loved children. A waitress from a bar covered in grape leaves approached him, and he ordered a local beer. To his surprise, the beer arrived on a tray with another note from Tibby. I work like a fury. See you at high stakes at eight. Dinner is at my expense. Looking forward to meeting you. Your tea. Do you know Tibby? He asked the waitress, not hiding his surprise. She shrugged. The manager called and said to give you this message. But how does he know I'm here? She shrugged again. Cameras, they are everywhere. He has whole banks of monitors that he sits and monitors. There is no time to rest. He took a sip of his beer and tried to collect his thoughts, once again unsettled by Tibby's communication style. Okay, she's working, but she could have tried harder to greet him. Even a simple message would be better than sending it through a stranger. And why did she write love at the end of the note? He assumed it was just a formality, although under the circumstances it was tactful. Then he thought that Tibby wanted their first meeting to be in public. She was nervous too, it was natural after such a long separation. He stretched his beer. Tiredness and heat made him sleepy, and it was enough for him to just sit and watch people come and go. Beautiful, tanned couples walked by. He would have to be careful with his pale skin from sitting indoors for long periods of time in the northern summer. After some time, his attention was drawn to a woman sitting alone at a table a few meters along the beach. She was also pale. A straw hat covered most of her face, and she was engrossed in a book. It seemed to him that, despite her unusual beauty, he was not at all interested in women. Tibby killed the possibility of romance in him. The woman turned so that he could see her face under the brim of her hat. Her expression conveyed sadness, or perhaps loneliness. Either way, she was a femme fatale let all men beware. Fascinated, he did not take his eyes off her. He wondered who she was waiting for, but no one came. After finishing his beer, he returned to the chalet to shower and change clothes. He looked towards his neighbors and saw that they were also preparing for the evening. Although it was still quite hot, the furious heat of the day had passed and Nicole was dressed in a creamy yellow evening dress. He complimented his friends on their appearance and learned that they were also heading to the High Stakes restaurant. I'm meeting my wife there, so maybe I'll see you, he said. Let's buy you a drink, Tim suggested. There'll be a dance floor and we'll have a couple of cocktails before dinner. It's my turn to treat, Philip replied. I still owe you for the champagne. He thought it was worth spending the evening alone with his partner, but perhaps both Tim and Nicole were afraid to be alone with each other. Philip found the restaurant behind a statue of a topless girl and a jug. He called Tibby's name and sat down with a glass of wine at the bar next to the dance floor. The couple twirled lazily. He wondered how long Tibby would keep him waiting, and he struggled to clear his thoughts and relax. To prepare, he imagined the worst-case scenario. We were a good couple while it lasted, but now I have found a man I can truly love. Don't worry, Philip. It's just one of those things. Nothing lasts forever, and I'm filing for divorce. We'll go our separate ways. It would have been even worse if Tibby had come with her new lover on her arm. He was sure that she was capable of such a cruel move. Preoccupied with this image, he did not notice how Tibby sat down on the chair next to him. She laughed, throwing her purse on the table. Her hand was on his shoulder before he could react, and she kissed him on the lips. I was so looking forward to this. Philip, you look wonderful. I'm so glad, because I was afraid that you didn't know how to take care of yourself. And you look beautiful, Philip answered, quickly collecting his thoughts, surprised by her warm greeting. Philip quickly pulled himself together, embarrassed by such a warm greeting. He examined his wife carefully, surprised at how much of her was familiar, but noticing subtle changes as well. She was tanned, looked slim and fit. Her smile remained the same, but an unusual wariness appeared in her gaze, which she could not hide. Both were clearly feeling uneasy after the long separation. It was an instinctive reaction, but Philip felt his spirits lift a little at the sight of her. 
Looks like this place has done you good. You seem to have new ideas about fashion, he noted cautiously, referring to her short, tight dress. Never during their life together had she dared to show off her cleavage so openly. She smiled. You noticed? Yes, they showed up. This place inspires new thoughts, and that's wonderful. But I'm so glad to see that my husband hasn't changed. We have so much to talk about. The waiter stood nearby and Tibby ordered herself a martini. Philip insisted on staying with the wine. It was time to seize the initiative. Tell me, Tibby, what can we say to each other after four months of silence? Is it over? She couldn't meet his gaze, and Philip expected to hear, yes. Instead, she looked towards the dancing couples and lowered her eyes. You have every right to be mad at me, she said, leaning over and kissing his cheek. I want you to enjoy this holiday so we can get to know each other again. You probably feel that I treated you badly. I understand that. At that moment I had no choice, but now everything has changed. As you noticed, I have changed, and mostly for the better. Now I see everything differently, and I understand that I was wrong when I said that I don't love you anymore. I'm happy just to be with you. You feel it, right? I want to prove that I am a good wife who appreciates her husband. Give us a chance. Love can overcome anything, and perhaps you will find the strength to forgive me, and we will both want to move on together. What do you say? It was even more shocking than the worst scenarios Philip had imagined. He didn't know what to answer. Tibby's kisses still burned on his lips. She said almost everything he could have hoped to hear. And yet, and yet, you know, it wasn't so bad for me alone, he said unexpectedly to himself. I started eating normally, not your diet foods, and I don't have to clean up after you. Philip, how unfair this is. How can you? She tried to laugh and pretend that she took his words as a joke, but Philip noticed that she was offended. When you left, I realized how little you invested in our marriage and our home. You have a strong feeling that you are owed everything, so you think that it is enough for people to give a little in return. You were probably spoiled as a child. You think that your presence is already a sufficient reward for those from whom you take something. No, she was shocked by such criticism. I know I have flaws, but I'm not that bad. I understand that I must apologize, and I will do so. I ran away as soon as I said a word. It was unforgivable. I have to make amends. I'm just asking you to give me a chance. He tried to concentrate on the main thing. You're doing it well, Tibby. But this sudden warmth of yours is too unexpected after months of winter. You managed to thaw in the sun, and all this time I sat in the ice cave. Tell me, what have you been doing all this time? Who's your new boyfriend? My boyfriend? Don't say that, Philip. I don't need a boyfriend. I'm a married woman. Now we are in the season. I work 16 hours a day and sleep the rest of the time. Believe me, working in paradise is not easy at all. Do you want me to believe this? This is true. She kissed him again. It's not easy for both of us right now, and I'll help you thaw out. Just give me a chance. Let this place work its magic. You'll be a new person in no time. She leaned forward to kiss him, her arm wrapping around his neck. The tension lifted from his shoulders. He glanced at her cleavage, and at that moment he caught the eye of Tim and Nicole sitting at the bar. It was impossible to ignore them, and he stood up. Tibby, these are my friends, Tim and Nicole. We met on the way from the airport. Now Tibby had to quickly collect her thoughts, and she forced a smile, although it was clear that she was irritated by this interference. It's so nice to meet you. All of Philip's friends are my friends. Nobody knew what to say. Finally, Tim spoke up. We wanted to have dinner, but we didn't know you had to make reservations here. We'll have to wait until they find a place for us. I don't want to go to a burger joint on the beach. Let me help, Tibby responded with unexpected enthusiasm. At the end of the day, I'm the hospitality manager here. She quickly went to the bar, talked for a few minutes, and returned. Everything is settled. In a few minutes, a table will be freed up for you. That's very kind, Tim said. Soon a waiter approached them with four glasses of champagne. It's a compliment from management, he said. Now we're even, 
said Philip. I repaid your treat. He explained to Tibby about the free bottle of champagne and noticed how she raised an eyebrow slightly when he mentioned Ben. Still, there's nothing to celebrate yet, Nicole said, quickly drinking the champagne and doing her best to catch Philip's eye. He thought she was flirting. Trying to make the evening enjoyable, Tibby turned her charm on Tim, and Philip admired her ability to win people over. He did worse with Nicole. He tried to talk cheerfully about exploring the resort, but she interrupted him impatiently. Obviously Tim and I are not happy. Our marriage is a farce. We shouldn't have come here. People want to have a good time, but we make everyone around us miserable. Why do you say that? Philip tried to take his mind off his problems with Tibby and focus on the Nicole drama. It's written on my forehead. Jezebel, a woman of easy virtue. Adulteress. Tim deserves a good woman, but that's not me. Concerned, Philip looked closely at Nicole. She had graceful features and subtle beauty. But behind this was hidden a sharp and embittered look. You can't be serious. Why not? Doesn't a woman who sleeps with her lover the day after her wedding deserve such words? Philip looked back, but Tim and Tibby were deep in conversation and didn't seem to hear anything. You don't believe that I could do something like that. Marcel is my piano teacher, a brilliant musician who has performed all over the world. We met and he made me into an artist that people would pay money to listen to. We are passionate about our music and dedicated to our craft. I don't even remember how it started. Our work was so intense, but somehow our musical connection turned into a secret sex life. It's not love, but we can't stay away from each other. This is our release from stress. Everything continued at university, and I thought that after graduation it would end. I assumed I would outgrow it. Met Tim and fell in love with him. He's so stable, so normal. I was sure that we would be happy but I couldn't get rid of the habit of sleeping with Marcel. He prepared me for concerts, and at the end of rehearsals we made love. I tried to stop, but we still made love in the green room during intermission at concerts. I must be sexually obsessed. It's wrong, but I couldn't stop. I decided that if I married Tim, this would have to stop. I was sure of this until I met Marcel for the first time after the wedding. We spent the whole day in bed instead of rehearsing. I am a woman of easy virtue. This is the most accurate word for me. Philip struggled to find the words to respond to this frank story. Nicole was seriously confused. Does Tim know? Certainly. We both thought marriage would be the answer. That I need to get the past out of my head. That I need a new start to grow up. I would have grieved a little and would not have seen Marcel again. But it didn't work out that way. It is too important for my concert preparation and has become too familiar. I'm too weak or immature to break up with him. We reassure each other and make life possible. I can't be a good musician without it. I want to do the right thing for Tim, but I can't. Why are you telling this to me? Because I'm worthless as a wife and as a person, and people need to know that. But you love Tim. He is kind and handsome the perfect father to a whole house full of children. He deserves a simple, quiet life without clouds on the horizon. I adore his genuine enthusiasm and his honest, engaging straightforwardness. But he can't handle my demons. Nobody can. You are still young. Don't be so hard on yourself. Everything can change. This was the best Philip could offer. Both understood that this was just empty consolation. He was relieved when the waitress showed Tim and Nicole to their table, but the real test awaited him again. Nice girl, but tasteless clothes. I gave them our table, Tibby explained. We will have to wait a little longer, but we have so much to discuss. Tell me about your work. I know how important she is to you. Are you worried that you will lose your share of my pension? I quit my job at the bank. I didn't see the point in this. I waited until I received the bonus and told them everything I thought about them. I should have told you, but you weren't in touch very often. I will sell the apartment because I don't need it and I can't afford it. As soon as I get out of here, I'll go hiking in the Dolomites and Himalayas. Isn't that great? And I won't think about you even once. 
Philip couldn't help himself, he said all this to hurt, and they both knew it. They drank in silence. It's a surprise, Tibby finally said. Don't get me wrong, this is great for you. You have always loved nature. But are you sure you did the right thing? Without a doubt. Like you, I realize that life is short. There is no point in sitting and waiting for something to happen. We have to get up and do it. I was thinking about moving back to the apartment when the season here ended, she said. When he remained silent, she added, if you accept me. Like I said, I'm selling it. You weren't there to discuss it. But after what I said, Philip, we need to talk about the future. What has changed? You didn't love me. You didn't want to discuss your future with me. Have you changed your mind now? I mean, I didn't see what was in front of my eyes. After ten years of always having you by my side, I forgot that I love you. I can't forgive myself for this. If you can change your mind once, you can change your mind again. She loves me. She doesn't love me. Either love is for life, or it is not. I thought it was for life. But what I said was a mistake. I shouldn't have said that. I was confused. You believed what you said when you said you didn't love me. You can't deny it. But I wasn't in that state. I cannot be held responsible for this. So you think that if a person is not in the right state, then he is not responsible for his actions. Of course you don't think so. We are always responsible. Will you never forgive me? I have forgiven you. You showed that you are weak and selfish, like many people. I no longer admire you as much as I used to, but I forgive you because that is who you are. If we get back together, I will always think that one wrong word on my part or one moment of stress in your life, and you will leave again in search of something better. But you would have given me a chance. We're still married. You are still my husband. I'm weaker than I thought. I can't stand the pain a second time. We are married only on paper, but not in reality. We have no intimacy, no trust. How can this be called marriage? You challenged me to make things right. I will prove to you that I can be faithful and brave. I can fix everything. Just give me a chance. They eventually ate dinner, but Philip was too stressed and upset to enjoy the meal. He sipped a light white wine with fried anchovies and then ate lamb skewers with onions, peppers, lemon, rice, and creamy tea tzatziki. This was accompanied by an exquisite glass of gigandas, but he noticed almost nothing. Tibby made light conversation about the resort, how she swims every day, and the health benefits of the Mediterranean diet. They both didn't want to be the one to call it a night. It occurred to Philip that Tibby might be hoping for an invitation to spend the night in his chalet. He was thinking about this when he suddenly dozed off, resting his head on his hand. It was only for a moment, but when he woke up, they both agreed that it was time to go to bed. Philip was left alone. The next morning there was a note on his doormat. I hope your dreams were sweet. I really want to be part of these dreams. We need to talk again. Yesterday you were tired after the road. Today I want you to enjoy this beautiful place and try something new. Have fun. See you for lunch at 1330 at the Seafood Cocktail Bar. Love, T. The envelope contained tickets for him and Tim to the golf course, where they could receive instruction from coaches. There was a ticket to the spa for Nicole. Philip scolded Tibby and decided that he would have to do what she said. His neighbors were delighted with the invitations. There was obvious relief on Tim's face when he realized he wouldn't have to spend the morning with Nicole. Nicole had never been to a spa before and was excited to see what the place was like. Mud baths and flogging with branches, Philip suggested, and Tim and I will have to endure the ridicule of some youngster who can barely drive a car. Everyone laughed and stopped for coffee along the way. After a night's sleep, everyone's mood improved noticeably. Tim then said goodbye to Nicole, and Philip noticed the warmth they both put into their goodbye kiss. Why is life so difficult? They headed towards the golf course, following the signs. It occupied a stretch of sand dunes to the side of the resort. The coach was already waiting for them, and both men laughed when they saw him. He looked young, barely out of college, 
and responded to their good-natured banter by pointing out the locker rooms and talking enthusiastically about the wide selection of hair gels and other personal care products. When Philip said he didn't know how to use them, the trainer proceeded to lecture him about the importance of appearance. Was Tibby implying that he needed to improve his appearance? They were met on the pudding surface by two very elderly Americans. We come here every year, one of them said, introducing himself as Blister. Bill Lister. Got it? Everyone calls me Blister, and this is Zoltan Payton VI, president of the largest axle manufacturer still producing on the east coast of the United States. You can call him chairman. Hey guys, Zoltan said, shaking hands firmly. Don't listen to my old friend Blister. I'm just one of the lucky vacationers. I come here every year to relax. The Blister is here for the wine, and I'm here for a special time with my girl. Does your girlfriend live here? Blister laughed. Zoltan has a new lover every year. He values excellence, and this place is the best. There are endless special services prepared for us here. He's like a boy on his first date when he comes here. You mean? He nodded. That's right. Of course, it's only for VIP clients and very confidential. But there is an endless stream of young women looking to have a good time and make money. Don't ask where management finds them. Philip felt a strange uneasiness and an unpleasant feeling beneath the glittering surface of the resort. Once they were on the pudding tea, Zoltan explained that special services were only available to guests of the Rodwell Elite International, the boutique hotel that occupied the same pseudo-medieval castle that Philip had seen from the balcony. What's your girlfriend's name? Her name is Trixie. For two weeks. Then I'm surprised you have time for golf. Zoltan laughed. Don't laugh at me, young man. I have to let Trixie sleep every now and then. Does Blister have a girlfriend? Ask him. He has a wife at home. But that doesn't stop him from enjoying it sometimes if he wants. We work hard and have a good rest. Now let's attack these balls. I need to lose weight. Trixie is really insistent. They spent an hour on the driving range, making putts, until the buggy arrived and two young men in aprons unloaded the refreshments, wine, coffee, and canapes. It was a morning snack for two Americans who invited everyone to join. The wine was difficult to resist, and Philip allowed himself a couple of glasses of Pouligny Montricate, but tried not to get carried away, although the canapes with salmon and caviar were very appetizing. Eat as much as you like. Blister reproached him. Life is too good to miss out on pleasures. I'm trying, Philip replied, but I wasn't going to eat until lunchtime. Next time you will be smarter. I never miss a chance to have fun. Before they could finish eating, the resort manager rode up to them on his cart. He ignored Philip and pretended to be extremely concerned about whether Blister and Zoltan were okay. They invited him to drink wine. A lot of work? Tim asked, who, like Philip, was ignored. Ben, who was wearing a shirt but still wearing a tie, shook his head, indicating that the matter was not worthy of his attention. The team here is constantly working to ensure our guests enjoy their stay. Turning to Philip for the first time, he curled his sensitive lips into something like a smile. I hope lovely Tibby finds time for her husband. We put a lot of work on her. Philip did not answer and held his gaze, returning it with the same persistence. What's wrong with these people? Ben is a man who can arrange for you whatever you want, Zoltan said, not noticing the tension. And at what price? asked Philip. It's time for me to get back to training. Tim walked with him back to the driving range. Does this manager disgust you? Tim asked. Definitely a little arrogant. Acts like he owns the place. Maybe so. I think he needs to be put in his place a little bit. Tim walked up to the cart, looked around casually, and removed the handbrake. Although the cart was on a slope, it did not move. Tim pushed her, and she began to roll forward. They quickly moved away and continued energetically hitting balls on the practice field. They continued for about another hour. When the food was put away, Blister and Zoltan mostly sat and watched. Philip then excused himself to meet Tibby in time. Tim decided to stay to play golf and agreed to meet Philip later, 
so they could climb the mountain behind the resort. On the way from the golf course, Philip saw a large SUV trying to pull a cart out of a drainage ditch. He didn't like Ben, but Tim's sabotage seemed excessive. Tibby came to lunch in a business suit and with a charming smile. They sat on bar stools and were served seafood salad with zesty horseradish mayonnaise and chablis. It was delicious and elegant, but Tibby immediately noticed that Philip didn't eat much. Eat, Philip. I've been waiting for this since this morning. This is my favorite place for lunch. Do you eat here often? She became strict. I work a lot. I have little time to sit quietly, and I am far from home. By choice. Tell me, does your job take you to the Rodwell Hotel? Certainly. This is part of the resort. Why are you asking? I met a couple of generous old men who were staying there. It looks like the highest class of luxury there. Did they say that? Fine. This is not for us at all. Do you think I would like it there? She laughed a little hesitantly. Dream. Tonight I thought we could dance before dinner, to work up an appetite. I'm going to hike up the mountain behind the resort after lunch so I can get plenty of exercise. You need to be careful. Nobody goes there. There are wild dogs there, and the thorns are terrible. I thought you would let me come to your chalet in the evening. It makes sense. I don't know where you live. I only have a room. The chalet is much better. So that's her plan. Philip didn't know what to think about sleeping with Tibby. He imagined this vacation as a brutal argument from which clarity about the future would emerge. He had forgotten his wife's ability to persuade through pleasure. Did he want her in his bed? Of course I did. Her body could provide comfort and satisfaction that no other could. But his conscience told him not to sell his sexual services too cheaply. By leaving him, she practically made it clear that she did not find him desirable. Let him ask. Let him recognize his determination to remain master of the situation. But if he wanted her back, what could better strengthen their bond than bed? Relax, I'm not going to hurt you. His uncertainty must have been obvious. No, we'll see how we feel tonight. You always put it off until later. His ambiguity about sex clearly prompted this snarky comment. You had months to figure out what you wanted. I had one day. And besides, I'm not eager to have sex with a woman who said she doesn't have a desire for me. I was wrong, and it was months ago. I explained this, but we don't have to have sex. Thanks for the clarification. Before you share my bed, you must convince me that you have no hidden agenda. I can do this. I only suggested this because I want to be with you. I love you. It would have been easy to go to the beach and fall asleep after wine with Blister and Tibby, but Philip was determined to climb his mountain. He put on leather boots to protect himself from the thorns. In his backpack there was a compass and a bottle of water, but there was no map it simply did not exist. At the beach bar, he sat in the shade with a beer and waited for Tim. He looked with his eyes for a pretty girl, that same fatal beauty, but she was not there. Tim was late, and when he finally arrived, he was restless and not the best conversationalist. He told the story of how Ben came to his chalet to accuse him of damaging the cart. The joke was caught on camera, and Tim was easy to recognize. It's not my doing, I told him. Why on earth would I do such a thing? He kept repeating that it was me and said that he had proof. I denied everything and laughed at him until he turned red and looked like he was going to hit me. He was so angry that he didn't notice that I stole his phone, which he left on the chair. Later I threw it in the pool when I went down to the beach. But why did you do it? asked Philip. Tim shrugged. Why not? Revenge on all the bad guys. Such anarchy surprised Philip because Tim seemed such a calm person. It seemed childish to him, but he couldn't help but admire Tim's courage. Suddenly Tim started talking about Nicole. Marriage is difficult. I think you know this. Nicole is so stupid. She loves me, but she can't control herself. She was spoiled by her parents. They were sure that she would become a virtuoso pianist, and I was never good enough for them. She's destroyed, but I love her. I can't just leave her. 
I hope that with time she will mature and find the strength to live her life correctly. Philip took a sip of beer and said nothing. Do people change? He thought it unlikely and felt he had to say something. If you love her, you have to find a way to deal with it. With love, everything is possible. It's too valuable to throw away. It's easy to say, but I can't handle her lack of respect for me. It's like I'm not important to her. And when your wife thinks so, it's like a wound deep inside, sucking away your strength. It's not that she loves Marcel. She loves me. But when they are together, there is no room for anyone else. And of course, I feel humiliated. Stress and suffering were carved into Tim's face. Philip felt helpless and unworthy to deal with such a confession. You need to think about yourself and what you want. Tim shook his head. I can't just leave her. Philip changed the topic of conversation. Why are you pranking Ben? How do you know he's a bad person? He sees Nicole's weakness. A young, beautiful, but broken woman is irresistible to him. He's vain and stupid, so I do my best to even the odds. They finished their drinks and decided to abandon the climb up the mountain. Exhausted from the conversation, no one had the energy or desire to exercise under the scorching midday sun. Another time, said Philip, regretting his weakness. They agreed to meet the next morning without delay. Tim went to look for Nicole, and Philip walked along the beach. The heat began to subside by midday, and the beach was crowded. He sat down and watched the people having fun and closed his eyes for a few minutes. He then returned to the bar and immediately saw the mysterious beauty he had met the day before sitting alone reading a magazine. He looked for a place under the palm trees near the bar, but all the tables were occupied. Wanting to take advantage of the situation, he approached her desk. Do you mind if I sit here? he asked, pointing to a chair away from her. She shrugged, clearly not interested in him. No problem. Distressed by her manners, he tried to find a question to get her attention. What a beautiful resort. Is this your favorite place? I've seen you here before. She looked at him with irritation, as if she was used to annoying men disturbing her peace. Yes, this is a beautiful place. I usually rest here for a few minutes before starting work. He smiled. Her face was not touched by the sun, and he wanted to find a reason to admire her. What are you doing here? I don't think I'm allowed to talk about it. We are all here to make sure our guests enjoy their holiday. The official answer. Probably something shameful. Let me guess. I can't imagine you working in the kitchen or made the hotel beds. Are you a waitress? She looked down at him as if his assumption was undignified. It must be a pleasure to work here, no matter what you do, he added, thinking of Tibby. It's always like being on vacation. Here, where there is no time and nowhere to go, you belong to the owner. I only come here because I have to. Do you have to come here? I mean, I come here for the money. They fell silent, and he watched her, pleased that she, albeit reluctantly, still kept him company. She returned to her magazine, and he stopped trying to get her attention, preferring to watch silently. Just like last time, the waitress came over with a note. This time, the note was not for Philip. His beautiful companion took it from the tray, glanced briefly, and, taking the bag, stood up. Okay, time to go to work. Goodbye, Snow White. We definitely need to do this again. She frowned. I'm not Snow White. Why are you saying such nonsense? And she left. Still not wanting to be alone, Philip walked along the hot sand towards the sea and cooled his feet. He then returned to the chalet to rest and prepare for the evening. A note was already waiting for him there. Tibby worked late and was unable to have dinner with him. She will come to the chalet as soon as she is free. Tibby arrived late when most of the people at the resort were already asleep. Philip almost fell asleep, sitting in front of the TV with another bottle of beer. He had almost given up hope of her coming and was forced to quickly gather his thoughts when she knocked on the door. She looked tired but immediately hugged him and held him tightly. It's so good to feel you again, Philip. I'm so glad you're here. Did you work a lot? You can't even imagine. Working in such a place is not at all idyllic. 
She had been away for so long, but her habits were not forgotten, and Philip immediately realized that they would make love. Sex with Tibby didn't mean anything. She kissed him in her special way, then took a shower and appeared in the room, wrapped in a towel. It was unusual. You started showing off, he said in surprise. Living in a warm climate teaches you to wear less clothes, she answered easily. Are you ready? Ready. Yes, he wanted to make love, but when they got into bed, he couldn't resist making a sarcastic remark. Do you think that I'll just go ahead and make love to you after such a long break? Nonsense. Of course I will help you. And why should I want to make love to you? If I just wanted sex without love and desire, I would be better off with a woman of easy virtue. At least she would pretend to be interested. Don't be so mean. I already said that I love you. And it's not easy for me either. Let's help each other, and I assure you that I will not lack enthusiasm. She didn't lie and made love to him with unusual energy. After Tibby fell asleep, Philip lay on his back, trying to comprehend what had happened. She made a real effort in bed, and he wanted to understand why. Was she rewarding him for something he had done, or was she preparing him for something she was going to ask? And all this time he was tormented by the main question, what does he want? Tibby left very early, and soon after her Philip got up, filled with energy after sex and a sense of new possibilities. Is there really a chance to save their marriage? Common sense told me sex meant nothing, but it didn't feel that way. He planned to have breakfast at a fast food bar and then walk along the beach to the Cape. If he accidentally meets his beautiful stranger, it will be a bonus. Before he could reach the girl with the jug, he was called out by Blister, who, as it turned out, was also an early bird and showing signs of a surge of energy. Let's go to a wine tasting, said the old man. I promise I'll show you something you'll like. But I didn't even have breakfast, Philip objected. Have breakfast with me. I have a driver booked for nine. We'll go over the mountain to a little bodega I know. This is a treat not to be missed. You convinced me, if you're really serious. Of course, seriously. Now let's have breakfast. Philip enjoyed the company, and it seemed that Blister was also alone. Where is Zoltan this morning? playing golf. Zoltan likes to sleep on vacation. Every day is a day of rest, you know, breakfast in bed, reading a newspaper in the sun, siesta. I think this year the castle maidens are even more demanding than usual. He needs to be fresh for tomorrow evening, when there will be a performance one of the main events of our stay. Virgos, Philip had a disturbing vision of his fatal beauty lying next to the bulky figure of Zoltan, the thought had already occurred to him that his gorgeous stranger on the beach was too good to be true. He remembered the note that called her back to work. She could be the ideal exotic companion for a wealthy guest in need of company and entertainment. I haven't heard anything about the show. It's for hotel guests. Recreation of historical events with the participation of beautiful girls. They're putting on an exciting little play. And maidens are involved in this if they can play. Philip wasn't quite sure what Blister was talking about. Blister led him around the Rodwell Hotel to a secluded terrace surrounded by replicas of classical sculptures. Through the open windows, Philip saw a bar with a coffee machine and a waiter dressed in a white shirt and black trousers. This is the only place where I can invite guests. Management is extremely jealous of the interior spaces. No one except those who pay full price is allowed even close. The same goes for performance. They were served coffee and croissants, then eggs benedict and more coffee. Philip was enjoying his breakfast until he suddenly choked on his coffee. Manager Ben came into the bar with Nicole. Philip watched them through the window as they talked at the counter. What's happened? Blister noticed a change in the atmosphere. This is Tim's wife. What is she doing there? Why don't you ask her? Looks like she's been invited for an interview. Blister looked at them for a while. Tim's wife is very beautiful. She shouldn't talk to Ben. He brings trouble. What do you mean? asked Philip. I mean, he has a special eye for beautiful girls. This is his own little scheme, the maiden of the castle. He wants to make sure he always has enough of them. 
I think he makes a good living from it in addition to his salary. Before Philip could ask any more questions, they were interrupted by a woman, slightly older than Philip, dressed tastefully and showing a generous cleavage, bronzed with tan. She smiled welcomingly and hugged Blister, and then moved to hug Philip. He avoided the hug and shook her hand formally. Don't be so shy, Blister said, laughing. This is Mimsy, my companion for today. Don't pretend you're not impressed. Mimsy sat down and took her coffee, holding herself with dignity under the curious gazes of both men. Philip looked at her carefully and noticed that she was indeed very attractive under a thick layer of makeup. Do you like to relax here? He asked politely, trying to find the right tone to speak to the woman he considered a paid companion or escort. She smiled and nodded. I look forward to this vacation every year. You can relax here and I meet such interesting people. We had a great time last year, didn't we, Blister? Of course, Mimsy is the cream of the crop. You are so beautiful, dear, but believe me, Philip, I chose her not for her appearance, but for her mind. Ask her anything and you will see that she can talk about any topic. Philip and Mimsy laughed. Philip said, have you climbed the mountain? I was going to do this yesterday, but I drank too much wine and the heat was unbearable. We need to get up at dawn, she answered immediately. There are no maps, but you can follow the ridge and it will lead you up a steep climb over rocks all the way to the top. Did you get up? She shook her head. I know someone who loves this place. Climbing is a great way to stay fit when it's so easy to be tempted to drink and sleep all day. See what I'm talking about. Blister was clearly proud of himself. Mimsy thinks I should play sports instead of enjoying life. She has great advice and is a walking university student. Well, if everyone is ready, let's go find my driver. Are you sure there aren't too many? asked Philip. The couple laughed. Flattery is always appropriate. Mimsy said. Philip is afraid that we will make him stand outside in the sun while we enjoy each other in the back of the limousine. Manners, said Mimsy. Don't embarrass the young man. We won't do anything like that. But it could be fun. They got into the car and drove deep into the island. There was a lot of laughter in the car, generous hugs for blister from Mimsy and attention to all his whims. He liked the way she cared for him, and he spoke to her as if he were a young lover. Philip's mood also improved. He was lucky that he had made love early in the morning. It freed him up and allowed him to appreciate Mimsy with a distanced interest. He remembered his mysterious girlfriend on the beach. Perhaps she also went to work after receiving a note from the waitress, and Tibby, another employee who depends on such notes. Was she not part of some disturbing current beneath the surface of this realm of pleasure? They arrived at a neat vineyard where they were greeted by staff and given a tour of the winery. They then sat in the shade with small glasses of chilled white wine, made, they proudly said, from the Lagordy grape variety. The wine was light and fruity, not at all like Philip had ever drunk. Blister tried several vintages. It's a new variety for me, Blister said. Where has he been all my life? Waiting for this moment in the sun with good company. Mimsy replied, Blister, you're lucky. A man who creates his own happiness. They were sipping wine when the winery owner joined them. He and Blister began a lively conversation about grape varieties and winemaking. Mimsy asked Philip if he was enjoying his holiday. It's an idyllic place and I love the sun and the beach, but the resort itself is like a prison camp. She laughed. It's much more like a camp for the staff than for the guests, but most vacationers are quite happy to be told what to do. It's no worse than a cruise ship. Philip took the opportunity to ask a question that had been bothering him for a long time. What do you think of the resort manager, Ben? She laughed again, but didn't answer right away. This is a strange question. He is my boss, and I like my job. We have only the most professional relationship with him. I didn't want to hint at anything different, but I have a reason for asking. I saw him talking to a friend of mine, a young woman who is currently going through a crisis. It was at the Rodwell Hotel, and I can only assume they were there so her husband, Tim, wouldn't see them. 
I saw Nicole. She's a beautiful girl. You say it like it's enough. The question is whether a young, vulnerable, recently married woman is safe with Ben. You yourself know the answer to this question. He's going to use her somehow. Don't make me talk bad about your boss. Should I try to stop her? Yes. Now tell me, how do you like the wine? Isn't it wonderful? They stopped at a tavern for a late lunch, and Mimsy and Philip talked while Blister slept. After a while, she also dozed off, explaining that the evenings are the busiest time for the maidens of the castle. They returned to the resort only around noon. A note was waiting for him in Philip's chalet. I was looking for you at lunchtime, and it's a pity that I didn't find you. Maybe you didn't receive my note. But wasn't last night bliss? I'm busy until late in the evening, but we can have dinner. I'll let you know where. You're beloved. P.S. Wait for me at the chalet at night. Tibby was not his favorite. A wife, yes, but certainly not a mistress. Nicole's problem still remained unresolved. Philip splashed water on his face and went to a nearby chalet to see if Tim was home. Nicole opened the door. She didn't seem happy about his visit. Did I distract you? asked Philip. I was studying, she replied. Philip looked around in surprise. Do you have a piano here? She shook her head impatiently. I don't need a piano. I replay Bartok's third concerto in my head. This is how I learn a new piece. It's impressive, Philip said. She shrugged. Come in. Tim would like me to offer you a drink. I don't need to drink, but I'll come in for a while. He followed her into the chalet, trying not to show that he was annoyed by her hostility. Do you want to take advantage of my frankness? She asked, closing the door. I don't understand what you're talking about. Philip was surprised. You think that since I'm a woman of easy virtue, you can take advantage of the situation while Tim is not around, she said with contempt. No, this is outrageous. You are not a woman of easy virtue, and I would not do this even if you were. I came for a completely different reason. I came to warn you. Stay away from Ben. She turned away and wrung her hands. I don't know anything about him, she said with a quiver in her voice. I wouldn't trust Ben. I saw you talking to him. Did you see? What did you expect? He wants to help me, she said bitterly. Not Ben. You are here to rest and relax. Stay away from him. Why? He offered me a job that would allow me to stay here. When Tim gets home, I'll stay until I get over my disgusting habits. Philip thought before answering, realizing the depth and danger of the crisis Tim faced. Don't you understand why he recruits women? I know some of them. One is called Mimsy. These are single, experienced women who can handle anything. Women old enough to understand that they use their bodies because they can't find a better use for it. They sell themselves for sex and company. I'm not naive. What better use can I make of my time? I am a woman of easy virtue by nature. Maybe I'll like it so much that I'll make it my career. And if not, at least I will be true to my nature. No, no, Philip was shocked and tried to find the right words to stop her. You will destroy yourself. You don't believe that I can handle it. I'm strong. I'm no worse than your friend Mimsy. Please don't do this. Think about Tim. That's the whole point. He will understand that I was never worthy of his devotion. I'm doing this for him. Don't do this, Philip repeated. I think it's time for you to leave, she said dryly. Philip walked out, full of disappointment and anger. He put on his boots to go to his planned meeting with Tim and began walking down the hill. The good mood from the trip with Blister and Mimsy had faded, and he tried to push thoughts of Nicole out of his head. She wasn't his responsibility, but he needed to talk to Tim and tell him what happened. The cafe was again full of vacationers who were eager to take shelter in the shade and eat ice cream. Philip checked his watch and looked around, waiting for Tim increasingly nervous about what he had to say about Nicole. Should he have warned Timothy about what he saw and what Nicole said? What would Tim do? Ten minutes passed and Philip realized that Tim probably wouldn't come. And then he saw his beautiful femme fatale, his Snow White. 
She had a book in her hands and was looking around for an empty seat. All tables were occupied. Have a seat here. Do you remember me? He called her. I'm waiting for a friend, and it seems he won't come. This is the place where people fail, she said, and sat down in the offered seat. There was not the slightest embarrassment in her behavior, and she looked at him coldly. I only have ten minutes. This is my coffee break. She called the waitress and ordered herself a coffee. Philip ordered coffee for himself, too. He wondered again what made such a beautiful woman go to work at late hours at a vacation resort. It was disappointing to think that she, too, was the type of girl who provided services. Do you know Mimsy? he asked unexpectedly. She looked down at him. I know Mimsy. Why are you asking? She's one of the people I met. You can read your book if you want. I won't mind. My friend and I were planning to climb Mount, but now there's hardly enough daylight. She put the book down and showed interest in him for the first time. You can handle it. I've been to the top more than once. Evening is the best time, and you will enjoy it. This is a mysterious place. If you're lucky, you might see a turtle, maybe a squirrel. There are definitely goats there. She didn't look at all like a lover of the outdoors, and Philip was surprised. She laughed when she saw his reaction. I love the mountains. Why not? You look like someone who spends most of his time at a bar, he chuckled. How gallant you are, she snorted. So what if so? I met a lot of interesting people at the bar. We all have to make a living somehow. The waitress brought coffee and another note for Philip. Sorry, Nicole, I won't be able to come again. My friend won't be able to come. It seems that I am doomed not to climb the mountain, Philip said regretfully. Do you really want to go up there? She asked. He nodded. I'm free in an hour. Today is my day off. I can show you the way. The proposal came unexpectedly, and Philip felt a certain wariness. He didn't think much about his companion beyond her appearance, and considered her an arrogant girl who barely noticed him. Did he want to spend time with her? It's a long way to the top, and it's unlikely that we'll be able to return before dark. She smiled with slight irony. I'm serious. We'll make it in time. Only to the very top the path will become a little more difficult. But while it's light, we'll get there, and then the moon will rise. He found her smile a little mocking. You're not kidding, right? Are you sure I shouldn't spend the evening in some bar? She laughed and shook her finger at him. I hope you're in good shape. I'm not going to give up if you find it harder than you thought. Meet me in an hour at the top fence. Don't be late. She took her book and stood up from the table. But Philip was speechless. What is your name? Isabel. And she left. To be continued. Subscribe to the channel and click on the bell so you don't miss the next part of this story. She will be there very soon. The link to the sequel will be in the description of this video below. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one.